Hey everybody, welcome to week two of Sociology of Religion. I hope that last week uh, you had a great 4th of July and I know that we kind of started late in the week due to the holiday, but I hope we get going this week um, full blast. I will talk to you a little bit uh, also throughout this week. Um, look for announcements. I'm going to be sharing some uh, connection times for us to do some uh, conferencing as well. So hopefully we'll feel like everybody gets introduced to each other and uh, feels, feels a little closer as the 12 of us go through this. So last week we talked about basically what is sociology of religion and how do we study it? What's the theory that we apply to it using our three historical theorists of Marx, Durkheim, and Weber, and additionally, to kind of understand the questions that we might ask, like Peter Berger's existential questions. Today, we're going to focus on that sense of history, and I want you to, before we get started, think about as far back as you can think that you could put together a timeline of humanity. Um, maybe you've studied anthropology, maybe you've studied um, some sense of understanding culture or having some sort of a cultural history. Uh, maybe you've been in literature with mythology. So we currently live in a system where the predominant religion that uh, feeds into the system is Christianity. However, we have obviously many world religions as our timeline shared last week um, and also we have many adherents to different beliefs including that of um, polytheism or no belief in God at all, um, so or gods at all. So when we look at the history, we have to go back as far as we can, and every single one of our religions that we're studying has a deep history. So all major religions that exist today have ancient origins. Um, you look at the symbols that we were looking at last week as well. Um, even human or humanists um, have a sense of their uh, history in Stoic, Stoicism, um, ancient Greece. Um, if you look at Confucianism, there's a lot of similarities, not necessarily pointing to a higher uh, power as much as the ability to uh, live wisely and treat others respectfully. So first you have to think about if you are practicing a religion yourself, what are the ancient origins? Is it one of the oldest ancient origins. Um, some people go to Judaism, but really we saw uh, paganism and we saw uh, understanding of, of ancient agricultural uh, worship of polytheist gods long before we ever saw um, some of our organized religion. And, and that makes sense when we think about how humanity lived. We didn't live in civilizations. Um, we didn't live in communities that were large. We were typically nomadic. Uh, it doesn't mean that every, you know, if you look at this little continent of each one, not every one of those groups that's living on those continents is going to socially organize the same way or believe the same way. So that's something to keep in mind is that we have this ancient history from all these areas. So when we think about prehistory, we have to recognize these things too. Um, we typically in our United States history will point back to our early founders um, of history in America. Well, that totally disregards the fact that there were many civilizations of native tribes to the place that we call America, but at the time that was not what that was called. It was whatever tribal name that was ascribed to the territory. And there were lots of different tribal names. So religion's prehistory typically has non-white founders, except for paganism, which tends to have the barbaric um, history, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They're traditional in nature, meaning that there's a social cohesion of conformity. People do the same things and it keeps them in a peaceful state. And that peaceful state is often, you know, making sense of the world, giving meaning through the world through their labor, but it's not necessarily the labor that we think of as far as an eight to five job. It's the labor of living. It's the uh, understanding of, of cultivating the land or um, raising children or um, teaching the historical stories, um, the myths, the legends, 
in the ability to uh, read meaning into life. The earliest forms were mostly feminine focused because the earth was seen as this producer and they could make this jump. And if you look to the left over here, um, this is a goddess that is our oldest image of some form of deity. She obviously is buxom and beautiful and um, she is not the only uh, type of goddess that we see represented in the earliest forms of religion. But typically they have large mammary glands, maybe multiple. Um, they're typically nude because people were nude. This is the other thing is we didn't cover up. People think that early Christianity, you know, even uh, was very exposed to the Roman world, which Romans typically would run around in very little clothing if they were doing athletic training or, or that type of thing. So um, that's something we have to keep in mind. The shame of the body wasn't part of, of that history. And it was polytheistic. Typically people ascribe different meanings to different actions, different forms of weather, different cycles of the seasons. And they didn't see those as combative. They actually saw this as the way to explain how everything worked together. Religions were often agriculturally based, nomadic, tribal, as I've said, and their interpretations of the gods favored their survival. So there wasn't this antagonism. Typically, you weren't afraid of a god. Um, and typically, the goddess manifestation is what we see up to a certain point in time, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But that manifestation pointed toward practical sustenance and the celebration of life. That's what that sense of the goddess was all about. And there was a, a sense to it that there was not the male-female um, separation of value. Um, sure, there was separation of labor. We see that at certain points. Depends on the tribe. It depends on the part of the world you're looking at. But it does tend to be uh, seen in most of our early tribal origins that the goddess manifestation was the most powerful, but not the most um, feared. It was a. It was not a fearful. Uh, manifestation of a deity. It was one that wanted us to celebrate life and have that sustenance. Sometimes we see, for example, in our charismatic leaders, these types of pointing toward that manifestation of the celebration of life and sustenance. And I want you to think about that for founders. Moses, um, for example, was known to um, honor Miriam, his sister, and that even though they would have battles at times, there was a sense of of uh, expression of, of celebrating life together. In fact, Miriam's song in the earliest scripture is considered possibly the oldest living piece of scripture that we have that's on some sort of an ancient text that, that hasn't been destroyed. So that says something about that, that sense of the, the feminine. Often Jesus was criticized because he lifted up the, the life of women and, and didn't see people um, as male, female, and that preventing them from the celebration of life or, or leadership or connection and community. We see this with Muhammad. He had four wives. Those four wives all played large points in his life. In fact, he was uh, married to his first wife who was older, and she went into battle for him. Um, so there's lots of times that we see this type of goddess manifestation find its way back into our major religions. Sometimes it's celebrated, sometimes not. So how does your view of history change knowing that female deities were worshiped far longer than male deities? I want you to think about that for a little bit or maybe enter that into your question this week, which I have in our discussion. The earliest art celebrated and expressed tomb and womb theology. So this is the other thing. Theology means the study of God or gods. And so when we're studying God or gods and studying how different groups are interpreting what the meaning of life is and how they organize their life around that and community, we have to see what are the things that they are most in awe of. And typically it's the tomb or in awe of death, sometimes celebrated well. Our ancient uh, history would prove that people saw death sometimes more often in um, certain ways, but sometimes maybe not as often as we think. It depends on the tribe. Again, some people lived long into old age because they'd figured out how to uh, care for the land, be in fertile places. And we often think of tribal wars, but they didn't happen as often as later on in history. So our earliest history typically 
we saw people embrace death with less fear. And the womb, which was that unbelievable, you know, way in which a child came into the world. And that was seen as a miracle. And honestly, even though they knew that they had to have uh, procreation to have that happen, it was often elevated for women to, to really be able to share that it wasn't as hidden. So this is something when we look at our ancient art, we see celebrations and some of these cave drawings, some people even think that they were early, the earliest artists may have been females, um, that they may have been some of the ones who were garnering those skills, especially in the French caves, um, the world famous Le, Le Deux, and I don't know how to say it very well, caves. Um, often there's there's an elevation that women weren't just held off, you know, in a tent. They were out there being part of the community. Here's an easy timeline for you from the change from the feminine deity to the masculine deity. Um, it's 20,000 to 5,000 BCE, which means before common era, that we see mostly feminine images of God. That is our longest history of humanity living in civilization. Um, and in civilization, I mean being tribal nomadic and eventually coming to create communities, civic areas. I've been to Jericho, which uh, its earliest time of foundation is thought to be about 10,000 BCE. And so there's large ideas that Jericho uh, in biblical tradition was seen as this large city that a figure called Joshua conquered. But honestly, at the timeline, if people tried to match that up, Jericho had been long um, crumbled to the ground, but people had remembered in their history that this was the oldest civic community with power. And so there was this symbolic image of conquering that, that uh, often was lifted into the mythology of, of Joshua. Joshua. 5,000 on, barbarians. This is where we start to see what we would say are Anglo history, um, even though I think this is important for us to recognize. We see all life somewhere coming out of the mid-eastern part of Africa. That's typically where we see that a little southern part of Africa or the continent of Africa. But as tribes moved out and um, we saw the Iberian Peninsula and all of these different areas in the north start to develop, Barbarians eventually uh, were pagans and they celebrated war gods because barbarians were barbarians. They took over other communities. There was this amazing amount of uh, male centered power um, that started to develop around that time. And we start to see uh, entire communities wiped out by these barbarians that eventually starts to change the image of power that the um, feminine images and the gods that got along with society, the war gods were ones that were mad and would support um, that sense of winning in war. So civilization then begins to urbanize at around that time, 5,000, we're starting to see civilizations um, everywhere. And if you saw that timeline of how people populated the earth, that's one of the reasons that I had that. If you didn't see that, it was in module one, Take time to look at it because it does make a difference in how we see how religion gets spread. But what happened is we saw these nomadic tribes lose power as these conquering nomads meant conquering gods, uh, conquering nomads meant con conquering their gods. And so we saw these more civilized, they started to create more urban centers to go out from, go to the nomadic uh, areas, conquer those nomads, and then in the process conquered their gods. There was a replacement of valiant male war gods over enemy female earth gods, and it starts to say in the development of empires, we also start to see misogyny start to come into play, because if you are having the powerful war god, you were, the enemy was your opposite. We'll talk about that in a second. Dualism starts to come into play. Replacement of hierarchy versus patriarchy rather than shared power versus matrilocalized localized religion also happened, where that replacement of hierarchy even though the societies were probably, um, you know, hierarchical in some form, depending on the priest in, the, in a nomadic uh, tribe or somebody that had more honor or prestige, there wasn't necessarily an 
unequal distribution of power. Um, and so we start to see that unequal distribution of power show up from shared power to and matrilocalized religion to this patriarchy where the male and male ideals are lifted up. So the shift can be summarized this way, it was economic, <clears throat> because obviously as people moved to civilizations, they started to create more labor intensive uh, sustainability of a community. They were uh, able to make material goods, they were able to trade, they were able to fortify the cities. And so we saw an economic change in a sense that economy actually was about trade and conquering versus sustainability and living. And we also see the God or God's less omnipresent, meaning with us, you know, these deities of the feminine were always very present. You could create images of them and they were something that um, reminded you or sometimes you felt their presence. Um, we started to see a hierarchy of God move far and away in the images and the stories um, from 5,000 forward and the male dominated barbaric you know, Alexander the Great is one of those that took conquer, conquered and conquered and conquered. Um, there was this sense of the high above deity, male God, you know, somehow blessing Alexander. And there's a lot of uh, stories around that. So we start to see that economic development connection. And then we also start to see God move away. By 800 BCE, which is before Common Era again, not all men in, were in power. We still had a lot of females um, that you know, were queens or leaders or priestesses, but the male-centered values have taken center stage for most cultures. And that's outside of native uh, cultures that are not exposed to the barbaric communities, not meaning barbaric, oh my gosh, they're bar but the barbaric civilizations. So we don't see this happen as much in what we currently call North America, Central America, and South America, because we don't have that connection across the waterways. But we do see this happen in the European continent, Africa, and starting to move into India. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how we see that change. Civilization, by the way, the definition is the stage of human social development. So it's all about development and organization that's considered most advanced. So people started to see these barbarians and there was an attachment of uh, the idea that this was more advanced than being nomadic. At least that was the idea that was sometimes, you know, if you're being conquered and you have a choice between your death and uh, assimilating, that's a question that people have to ask when it comes to being civilized. We also see the movement from polytheism, belief in many gods, to monotheism, belief in one god. And so um, we see this manifestation change, especially as the rise of Judaism is, you know, 4000 BCE is where we start, about 4800 is when we start to see or hear the history of what's called the Hebrew tribe or Hebrew people. We start to see the rise, obviously, of Christianity after uh, the Common Era. And so around 30 B, you know, 30 CE, we see the stories of Jesus, the ministry of this person starting to be written. And uh, within that hundred years, people starting to connect that uh, religion with one God, but in three forms that actually doesn't take effect the Trinity for two or 300 years. Um, in the form that is currently known as the Trinity. And then about 600-ish common era, we see uh, Islam and that importance that the number one phrase that you have to say to be Islamic is that there is only one God. And that's, an, it's, it's, they consider it the God that both Moses and Jesus are part of. Jesus and Moses are prophets and Muhammad's considered the final prophet. Um, in this monotheistic cycle. Um, interesting to look at all three scriptures, and I invite you to do that sometime. Maybe you might want to study each one of those and their connection in your final project. So you also start to see dualism appear, which is the opposites and conflict. So instead of things working together, which we see in a lot of the early religions, now I'm not going to shy away some of the nomadic tribes 
did have sacrificial type things that would happen. It depended, you know, it wasn't common. Um, we even see history of some cannibalism for some reason or another, but it's not as widespread as what um, some people might uh, present, um, as, you know, thinking that all religions were like that. In fact, the majority were not. Um, but we do see then as this monotheistic God comes in, that there is this God against all evil and the goodness versus uh, evil is suddenly entering in in a larger scope in the texts that are these original religions. Um, well, not original, uh, sorry, the major religions. We see the difference of dark and light, which was not necessarily seen as a bad thing. We saw a lot of good in the dark. In fact, a lot of creation stories really enhance that sense that it was darkness that we were created out of. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that light exposed that connection. Um, there's lots of things we can read about that. Male, female were seen as opposite, obviously, as we've stated before, because this female God uh, and female deities um, were something to conquer. And we see the dualism of one God versus many gods. Table 2.1 in chapter two, I think does a really good job of helping you understand polytheism and monotheism. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I would say this would be something I would look at closely. And when I put this um, up with just the slides, go back through if you haven't bought the text and make sure to look at this because I think it would really be good for your discussion. Um, you know, knowing the many different forms of pluralistic versus cyclical society the big mysteries um, of, of God, knowledge of the divine mystery to a select few. These types of things are important in polytheism versus monotheism, which is very linear, monistic, you know, only one true God, one true way. So that's important to, to recognize. We also have to recognize monotheism isn't something that's particularly associated with Judaism, Christianity, in Islam. In fact, Zoroastrianism, which was Persian, um, was the first exclusively monotheistic culture uh, where they, they believed in Zoroastra. And, and this was this um, god that um, had more divine connection, a sense of being maybe still more male, but um, not necessarily barbaric and, and warlike. Um, so we need to know that there's a sense of the God not necessarily being all conquering. Second, you need to know that in Egypt for a very short time, uh, there was a, a sense of monotheism with a couple pharaohs um, previous to Moses stories. And so we kind of start to see people uh, incorporate that in, in their leadership. And so um, those are two uh, examples of monotheism being around before we actually see it in the three uh, major religions that celebrate that. So changes to monotheism via the Abrahamic tradition then gives us kind of views that are not always opposed, but different. Um, the Abrahamic faith, meaning the Hebrew faith and the history of Moses as the, the major prophet of, of Israel, but there's a history to how Moses became that prophet. Um, and Abraham being the father of these faiths, we see that tradition in all three of the Hebrew, Judaic, Christian, and Islamic traditions. Once again, though, interpreted very different ways. So first we have the Abrahamic faith that kind of comes out of the 4800 BCE era as far as the stories being available. We don't have any original texts on any of these, by the way. Um, they're all copied. Um, but Hebrew, Israel, and Judaism is, is um, seen as the first rise of that major monotheistic belief. Then followers of Jesus adopt Jesus as one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God. That does not get settled really until about 150 uh, CE. We start to see some councils that start to adopt it. But once again, people didn't have the internet. They didn't connect easily. Um, we can't really imagine how hard it was for uh, movements to take place. 
So um, it took a while. Um, and there were major fights about who Jesus was. Was Jesus divine? Was Jesus even born as a baby, but a little mini human, which you'll see in art, which freaks me out every time I see it, <laughs> because it just is like, oh, that that's weird to me. But um, I totally get why they had those arguments, because you know, the world was still flat. <laughs> so there's a lot of reasons that they came a long way um, with what they had to work with. And then finally, finally followers of Muhammad uh, Islam adopt Moses and Jesus as prophets, but they correct what they believe is wrong about the Trinitarian faith of Jesus as one or Moses even considered a higher figure that Muhammad is seen as the last prophet. And you'll hear a lot of times the uh, Islamic tradition say Muhammad peace be upon him because of a, a way to say uh, that that's an honorable way for us to kind of correct um, this idea um, that there is three in one God that that seems polytheistic and against God. The other thing we have to recognize for example like Christianity but also Islam and uh, early Hebrew traditions and other cultures absorb some form of paganism as they go along, just like the conquering cultures that had started before um, with the tribes and, and the barbarians. We start to see the same practices happen with most Christian uh, Islam, um, basically the winning society taking over the other. And that, that's often seen as a, a form of development, not necessarily a form of superiority, but um, the ability for these groups to be able to conquer and absorb other societies and therefore fortify their cities and gain more uh, area in which to control. And, and that, that becomes, you know, uh, intersected all the way through. Um, there's a blend we see, for example, of polytheistic practices into monotheistic religion. We look at all these symbols. Those are all pagan. Um, you know, Sam Hain is uh, the, understanding of the changing of a season and and it's not seen as the wicked or the evil uh in for example pagan culture we see it as you know all saints day being the following day um there's just kind of this window to the world of the the eternal battle between evil and good that we've we've seen happen later but wasn't necessarily present um when it was originally uh practiced christmas tree totally pagan, <laughs> went with a sense of the greenery, being able to sustain the winter, and then of course the Easter egg, estra, uh, which is where we get the word estrogen and the feminine, uh, understanding the feminine uh, birth, that, that's part of now Easter in a new life that we talk about. It's not easy tradition transition, by the way, lots of Gnosticism, which means having knowledge from other places, it's a modern way of the ancient ideas and ancient systems being at battle with who has the real higher superior knowledge. Um, we see Gnosticism in Judeo-Christian milieus a lot. Um, for example, as they interacted with the Roman world, we started to see people uh, feel like they had higher understanding. We see education start to become formalized, so we start to see that prestige and it, even though it's not fully a class society, there is a sense where that education of God is, is elevated. And it's often at odds with the common everyday experience. Reminds me of Marx, where you have the owners of the knowledge and the people that are practicing their faith in these long historical ways. Um, and, and so you see that battle constantly. Eventually we see, and a lot of this is headed toward the Western history, and once again, I say that because the way world systems theory looks at, at the world is the current system that we see at the top of the pole of how we do things as capitalism. Capitalism has direct connection to Christian uh, development across the world, and in the process of that, we kind of have to see how other religions, even though they uh, were um, create, created or, or sustained um, or developed out of their own histories has had to have some sort of reaction to this Western world and this Western history. And so um, this is something I'm hoping with the videos that you look at for each week, for example, um, as we look, I think it's Hinduism this week um, and Buddhism, that we start to look at 
those histories in that way too, because I can't cover it all in the lecture. But going back to this westernized history, the fall of Rome, the rise of Constantinople, was where we also saw culture and class become key to success in religion because we saw people um, that were highly educated. For example, the Romans were considered not so highly educated, but highly barbaric, able to organize major, major war machines and war uh, kind of was how they conquered but they also then incorporate people and allow them to actually be more free with their religion. They weren't necessarily as um, intolerant as they're often portrayed. But then we saw Constantinople, which is around 325, and Constantine has started to change and become, his, mo his mother, Helen, was uh, converted to Christianity. She uh, asked him to be converted. He didn't really say he believed until his deathbed, but he set up the system of Christianity, and we also see then the fall of Rome and the rise of Constantinople as the major education center, and we see this great um, sense of, of um, what people started to call blessing, you know, that they were blessed because they were believers and educated, and, and we saw that culture and that class develop as it moved from Rome to Constantinople. Now, interestingly enough, what creates the unity in Christianity and the Christian kingdoms that start to develop and, and take over is that death is used as the great equalizer, that everybody at the end of their life will, if you know salvation has come, be in heaven. We start to hear that language. So Rome can use that when it's fighting its battles to say, hey, I don't care how poor you are. You're fighting for us. You're absolved of all your sins. Go and lose your life for this country because in doing so, you will end up in paradise. We hear that used a lot as a criticism of Islam. It has been used in Christianity much longer than Islam, at least 600 years. So um, then go on to the other side of a person justifying that they have more and that they are more educated. They don't have to fight those battles, but that at death, they will be humbled and they will have the same riches and that will not have as much meaning. So that's, we have to recognize that, that culture and class and that sense of compromise is something, um, you know, where we start to see people say, oh, I, I just have been born into this class. It's almost caste-like. Um, Start to starts to to rise, so we need to look at those two different empires: the Roman Empire and the Constantinople uh, Empire, Constantine's kingdom, kind of um, over in in the east, and Turkey is kind of where we see that um, current day. But the Vandal Barbarian Rome is full of poor, illiterate, disease-infested warriors that are losing their life for this salvation in the warlike West. And the Byzantine Empire, which eventually comes to power, destroys Rome, has a combination of the Crusades before they head into this major um, development of Europe. And we see lots of Byzantine Empire uh, architecture that has overtaken Roman architecture. They are wealthy, healthy, highly educated citizens and they're courtly. And so we see these two dualisms take over the argument forever, <laughs> it seems like, in Christianity and um, still going on today, just still going on today. Both Rome and Constantinople were Christian, but in 1054 we see the Crusades and led often by the idealism of Constantinople taking advantage of the barbaric uh, Romans to go and conquer. They were taking up the cross for empires and for God, and then eventually splitting into what we know as Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church, and they go back and forth for quite a while. We also see the rise of what we call the great hatred in sociology, the rise of the other being evil. Going back to that dualism, we start to see Anything other than the blessed kingdom is seen as something to hate and that God hates. 
that monotheistic God is a warrior God that wants it trampled out. And therefore, much justification from those communities and societies about the Crusades, even though they were some of the most horrific and um, bloodbath of, of a history that we've ever seen. In 1099, the three major religions, for example, um, neighboring religions in Jerusalem were Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So as we go back to the Crusades in 1054, um, it, was try it was trying to go against that norm and to break up that sense of unity and start to create a winning, uh, winning of Jerusalem started around that time, trying to win it for God. We see then the rise of empires, the rise of the nation state religions that um, start to believe in nationalist um, blessing by a monotheistic God. And along with that, we see early merchant capitalism develop, meaning these nation states start to trade as larger groups, not nomadic, not cities. We are seeing states. And then we see that individualism uh, start to rise, people trying to rise through class and status and owning others. We see the rise of slavery. The difference between biblical uh, slavery or slavery that people see written in scriptures is that those typically were seen as indentured servants, people who voluntarily would put themselves up for labor so they could pay off debts. They were promised shelter and food until they could pay off that debt and then we're often freed. And so we often heard of what people call Jubilee uh, or Jubilee-like type experiences where the slave was let free. That was often uh, seen as a way to kind of do a clearing house of people who were indentured, and then they'd start over again. That's not what the slavery is, what comes with merchant capitalism. People become commodities and they're seen as less than human. And this eventually gets determined by race um, and particular parts of the area and also happens to go along with their tribal, their nomadic, and they often are seen as um, uncivilized. So need to hold into uh, context that experience. Religion then is interpreted through labor and labor therefore um, being blessed by God. And as you gain more, um, you are seen as more worthy, but also you have to recognize um, that, that that continually um, runs into issues um, as people make money they often become less religious <laughs> so we have to talk about that too Karl Marx going back to him looking at the history of religion he will say that this is all social constructs that we've been putting together that perpetuates inequality and class struggle and especially when we see monotheism take place and go past those tribal native um, experiences of sustainability and not having as much class um, or inequality <clears throat> that religion has raised as a development of civilization. And, and that's really the way he looks at that. He also says that's tied in with materialism, which is part of the product of civilization and civilized communities and the rise of nation states. That making things, money, wealth connected to God's favor is the plight in life and individual responsibility is expected of that, especially as we see capitalism take rise. We also saw the rise of witch and warlock accusations during this time. In the text, there's a long uh, discussion about the Salem witch trials and the fact that it was teenage wealthy girls who were uh, accusing older, self-sustaining, widowed, or single women. Um, and that we start to see that dualism of the hate of women from women. We could go into all day about that with how that is in society right now because we still have that. Um, but there can be misogyny for women from women. Um, it doesn't have to be just something males do. And we need to make sure that we see how that's been enacted in religion. Because often women taking leadership was against that capitalist materialist uh, kind of society. And yet at the same time, these women were typically uh, and men, because men who were single and not married were often seen as suspicious. Um, they, they were seen as being free. And so these single women that were going to be married, this was their one time in life where they were prized before they were married off and not thought about much. And so it's a sense of agency and power that we see at play in these uh, long histories of accusing witches and warlocks of 
the cursing areas or the rise of the curse. And that curse typically is something that says, you know, that you are hindering my sense of agency, my sense of, of being noticed. And, and we've seen that wound through these stories. So if you want to study that a little bit more, um, <clears throat> I think as you look at Wiccan, which often gets associated with this, if somebody does study that for your final uh, presentation, please look at this, the difference between what was going on with society and what's going on with this. The other thing is the transformation of the family. The family is no longer a unit or a caste, you know, system um, where it's serfdom. You're not part of a larger kingdom or a leader or a city, but you're becoming a work unit that has a label attached to you of your family name. Um, and it carries the burden of success through individual labor and each person working to make that family name a sign of God's blessing and then be able to participate in these larger civilizations. And that religion becomes a form of um, being able to uh, uh, support and verify and validate that. Max Weber would say it's the ideal type that we start to see happen with the Protestant work ethic, that everybody who picks themselves up by their bootstraps, that has labored for the land, that has done all of these different things will show that blessing. Interestingly enough, if you go back in history and look at native tribes, they were often very healthy, wealthy, and not thinking about these types of ideas of how God, religion, and sustainability was um, part of, of individualist uh, work, but was done in communal work. And so uh, Weber would say the ideal type then was communal and what would be called mechanical society, a sense of, you know, everything works together. And then organic society is where individual labor kind of creates the symbiosis and keeps the symbols um, individually, um, you know, separated, but somehow seems normal that we're separated from each other and that it seems normal that we're part of this organic world where the individual is lifted up. If you want to read more about that, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, I believe, is one of the best forms of looking at religion and society and development and understanding a lot about how we um, see the intersections of what's going on in the developed world as it, as it reacts to the uh, religious world and vice versa. So uh, please bring, you know, if you want a copy of that, I can send it to you. Um, it's very important if you're a sociology student to have that. Okay, we're getting a little closer. I know this is a long one. Um, so the 1642 to 51 is the rise of modern capitalism. What we know today and how it's shaped history, the way we've stood on it, and this is what you need to know in fullness. Every bit of our living is obviously a social construct of the stories that have informed what we believe gives meaning to life. We'll say that again. Every bit of which we, that which we stand on is a social construct of the stories that we believe and that we um, believe tell us the meaning of life and our organization and development around that. So right now it's capitalism. That's what's shaping it. That is the end of history. I could not get to the whole thing, but I hope that it gives you an enlightened look at how to look at world religion and how intersections of different types of um, ideals, values, norms, and structures have come to be. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can email me, jtodd at emporia.edu, or text or uh, give me a call, 913-553-0267. I ask that if you're going to give me a call, text me ahead of time because I get uh, numbers that I don't recognize. And so then I would be ready for that. Hope you have a great week. I look forward to your posts.